lively bunch at 9 a.m. I like it. They all came ready. Was it the sunny skies out? How many appreciate the sunny skies? 86 degrees today. Well, if we haven't met, my name is Todd Doxson and I'm one of the pastors here at Love Church. And just again, just wanted to make sure we welcome you to church. If you're, if you're new here, this is your first time, can you just wave at me real quick? Just wave at me, first time. First timer, man, thanks for being here. Hi there, thank you for being here, love it, over here. First time on the, on the front row. Come on, I like it. Um, question for you, do you like Panera Bread? You're a Panera Bread girl? All right, Macy, can you hook her up real quick with a, just a little gift? A little, I, this is my spot, I love it. Uh, I love their breakfast sandwiches, maybe a salad. You look like you're probably eat well and health conscious, so maybe a, a grilled chicken salad. But uh, we, we like to do that, and some people take it the wrong way, like we're trying to coax people to come back to church. It's not that at all. It's We believe God's the greatest gift giver, and so we're just kind of trying to stay in stride with his, his character. And so thanks for being with us. And, Salad on God, so it'll be an anointed salad. There'll be no calories involved in that. And uh, really grateful to be with you. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Luke 19. You're in for a treat. One of my favorite Bible teachers of all time is here with us to bring the word. And uh, let me just try to, I wanna be really quick on this because I wanna give him ample time to share. In 1998, by God's grace, when I thought my football career was over, I had come to Christ about a year before, and my agent called. I go down to Miami, tried out, made the Miami Dolphins roster, and the first week I was there, I rented a convertible, being, being a Midwest kid in South Florida. I went to the beach, and I'm laying out, and some guy comes up to me. I'm laying out on this, like, you know, those layout chairs and he comes up to me he's like hey that'll be five bucks I'm like what bro like I gotta pay to lay out in South Florida and he noticed I had this WWJD bracelet on he said are you a Christian I said man I just came to Christ and uh, I just moved down here he said well you gotta come to my church and I said well I work on the weekends do you have anything during the week he's like matter of fact we have a Wednesday night service I'll give you the address I'll meet you there and I'll go to church with you and, uh, you know, you never know, man, like, is it a mandate? Is it like a serial killer? Like, what, what are we doing here? But I just, this guy was a cool dude. He's a winsome guy. And so I met at this warehouse place. I walked in to this church called Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale, and I was undone. I had no idea church could be like this. I was, I was crying one minute. Um, I was laughing the next. We went right through the Bible. I could relate to it. I'm like, oh my goodness. Well, that was 1998. The church was about 15,000 people at that time. In 1985, two families from Las Vegas felt a call to go to Fort Lauderdale to start a church. They started in a funeral home with four with, with two families, and 13 years later, I stepped into that church. And the beauty is, one of those two families is here with us today to bring the Bible. Yep. Pastor, Pastor Fidel Gomez and his amazing wife, Teresa, are with us, and he's gonna share from God's Word. So can you just stand to your feet real quick and warmly welcome, let's bring honor to the house, Pastor Fidel Gomez in the house. Here we have a seat. Todd, can I have a little table or something to, oh, okay. You gave that girl a, a, a Panera little thing. You know what, you know what Todd gave me? He gave me a half-eaten Taco Bell burrito back in the back. Thank you, man. That was good. Had a little green stuff on it. I'm not sure what that, uh, what that was. 
We are in the Gospel of Luke chapter 19, if you would uh, open that up. Um, give Kevin a round of applause, would you? We've prayed, we've asked the Lord to be with us, to bless our time together. Let's get into it. There are things that you can uh, postpone. There's things you can uh, put off. There's things that you can procrastinate. You can uh, put off washing the dishes. And what's going to happen after a while? You can put off doing the laundry, but what's going to happen after a while? You can, put, you can put off taking a shower, and what's going to happen after a while? But there's one thing you cannot put off. My wife and I, we came to know the Lord. My wife, where is she? Right here. We just celebrated 50 years of marriage, by the way. We came to know the Lord in 1978, and we've seen so much change happen. The world is changing. So much change. You saw what happened on the news yesterday in Israel. A lot of things happening. There's one thing you cannot put off. There's one thing you can not procrastinate, and that is getting really serious with the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot put that off. There's a story that is told about a man that he is sitting at his desk doing some work and he opens up one of the drawers in the desk and he, he, he finds an old receipt for a pair of shoes that he had taken to the shoe repair shop five years previous. So he looks at this ticket and he goes, I know that he ain't got the shoes anymore. But I wonder though, I wonder if he does. I think I'll go check. So he, he takes the receipt and he goes to the shoe repair shop and in an embarrassing kind of a way, he puts the ticket on the counter and he says, listen, I, I know it's been five years, but I'm just wondering, I, I'm just wondering, I, I brought these shoes here and I know you don't have them, but I just, and the guy goes, well, wait, listen, let me go check. Let me go check in the back. You never know. So the guy comes back empty-handed. The owner of the shoe says, I knew it. I knew you wouldn't have them. And he goes, oh, no, we have them. They'll be ready next Thursday. <laughs> Procrastination. Look at Luke chapter 19 with me, and we're going to read just a few verses that have to do with getting serious and living a life a bold faith. We see that in Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 28. After telling this story, Jesus went on towards Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. He came to the Mount of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives. And check this out, underline this. He sent, he sent two disciples ahead. Go into that village over there, he told him. As you enter it, you're going to see a young donkey uh, tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it. Bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying that colt? Say to them, the Lord needs it. So they went. They found the colt just as Jesus had said. Sure enough, <clears throat> as they were untying it, the owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? The disciples answered, simply replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus, threw the garments over it for him to write on. Like I said, I, I've entitled our short time together, The Blessings of Bold Faith. Here you have Jesus choosing two disciples, and he basically, in a roundabout way, says to them, go and prepare the way for me. Go ahead of me. I'm going to arrive there soon. 
I'll be there shortly, but I need you to go ahead. And I have a message that, you, that I, I want you to give to the people. And I couldn't get away from it. I couldn't get away from, that's us. I couldn't get away from the time in which we're living. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back and he's given us a message. He's put a message on your lips, on your heart, on my heart. And he has said, now go ahead of me. And, and, and give them a message for me because I'm going to be there soon. In the Gospel of John in chapter 20, the Bible says that on the first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. And Jesus came into that room and he said a few things. He said, peace be with you. These are the disciples. And he says to them, as the Father has sent me, now I'm sending you. Mm. <laughs> and when the first time I read that, I asked myself the question, wait, hold on a second. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me. Well, what does that mean? Where did the Father send him? Well, all you have to do is go back two chapters to John chapter 17. In verse 17, where Jesus says, the Father has sent me into the world. And Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, now I'm sending you into the world. So guess what that means, folks? That's why you work where you work. That's why you live in the neighborhood that you live in. That's why you have the family that you have. Because God's placed a message in your heart. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20, uh, the Apostle Paul says, God has given to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore, listen to this, you are God's ambassadors. As though God himself was making his appeal through you. You're the mouthpiece for heaven. You're the billboard of heaven. I don't know if you go to the movies much. We haven't in a long time. But I remember going to the movies and I remember if the movie is scheduled to start at seven, what time does the movie actually start? Like nine o'clock, right? Why? What, what, what is it called? What do you see first? Previews. So you sit there through the previews, and, and my wife and I, we, we, we watch the previews, and based on what we see on the preview, we will ask ourselves a question. Would you see that? And based upon what the preview was, we go, are you kidding me? I wouldn't waste a dime on that. Or, or the preview is so good that we look at it and we go, we can't wait to see that. We can't wait. Well, guess what, my brothers and sisters? You're the preview of heaven. So you go to work and you told people you're a Christian and people are watching you. What kind of preview do they see? Do they look at you and they go, <laughs> if that's what heaven is like, thanks, but no thanks. Thanks, but no thanks. Or do they look at your life and they see the preview of heaven that is biblical and they go, I got to see some more of that. I got to see some more of that. So these disciples are sent with a message. Get the people ready. I placed a message in, you, in your life. Go, go, go there. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this, but, but like I said, my wife and I, we've been Christians forever. Not ever, forever, for a long time. 
And, and, and we heard it from the time that we first got saved at Calvary Chapel, Las Vegas. They used to meet in an old auto parts store. Back in the 70s, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming soon. We used to hear that back then. And we, we believed it. We believed it. But I, but I got to tell you now, I'm in a place in my life today where I believe that we are so close to the return of Jesus that it could happen at any moment. It could happen at any time. And we are called by the Lord to not only be ready personally, but to prepare other people for the return of Christ. And I see what this church is doing with your pastor, with the leadership here. And I see a hunger to get the message out to get the word out. I hope you're a part of that team. Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 24, something that is so, so valuable. <clears throat> we'll move on here in just a minute. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, listen to what he says, people were eating Drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, up until the time that Noah went into the, the, the ark. They knew nothing about what was going to happen to them until the flood came and just took them all away. And Jesus says, that's the way it's going to be at the coming of the Son of Man. <clears throat> what is Jesus saying? It's going to be just business as usual. Nothing different. Could be a Monday afternoon, you're at work, didn't expect it, people eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. He said two people, two men will be out in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding uh, at the hand mill. One will be taken, one will be left. Therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know the day your Lord will come. And then he says this, but understand this. Understand this. If the owner of the house would have known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch. And he would not have been broken into. So you too must be ready because the Son of Man will come at a time and a day when you do not expect it. Folks, are you ready? Not only are you ready, but are you helping to prepare people? You've been sent like these two disciples. You have been sent with the message. We've been sent. And we have opposition. We have things that want to stop us. But the person that has the bold faith perseveres and pushes through the opposition and through the obstacles and continues to share the gospel with anybody and every. You remember the way it was? You remember when you first got saved? You remember how you would tell uh, people about Jesus that didn't want to hear about Jesus? You, you would find a way to just get that, that word in there. You'd be in a grocery store line and then there'd be a, some kind of magazine about the weather or something, about how it's going to be hot, and you would come up with something like, I know a place that's a lot hotter than that. <laughs> and there was always something, some way, that you would turn the conversation. Where are we with that? I, would, I, I pray that we would pray that prayer. <clears throat> the King David prayed, Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Restore to us that joy. And so I wrote it this way. I don't know if you like to take notes or write things down, but I wrote it this way. Bold faith can lead you to be in a verbal and visible witness. That's these two guys that go out there. Look at the next two verses with me, <clears throat> beginning in verse 30. Jesus says to these guys, go into that village over there. And as you enter it, you're going to see a young donkey tied there. 
and um, that no one has ever ridden. Take note of that. He's new. Untie it. Bring it here. If anyone says, why are you untying the colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. I don't know if you see the humor in that the way that I do. You're, you're one of the two guys. You're one of the two people that are sent to that village over there. And you're talking on the way, because I wrote it this way, if you like to write things down. Bold faith leads you to obedience even when you have limited understanding. You're walking on the way. Hold on one second. Sorry. You're walking, you're walking on the way. You're going to that village. What are you talking about on the way there? Can you believe what Jesus wants us to do? He wants us to go to somebody's house and just untie a colt. We don't know who it is. We don't know whose colt it is. Now, we live in Fort Lauderdale, not far from Miami. To put this into modern context, Imagine me going up to somebody's driveway in Miami. Now, do you know what a donkey was back in, the, in Bible days? This was their pickup truck. <laughs> this was their work vehicle. This was their pickup truck with a toolbox. <laughs> or their minivan. That's how they got around. And it's new. It's right off the showroom floor. It's never been driven. Nobody's ever been on it. And I'm walking up to the driveway. And I get in the car. I get in the pickup truck. And the guy in Miami comes out and he goes, oh yeah. <laughs> ¿Qué pasó? What are you doing? What are you doing? Oh, well, um, <clears throat> the Lord needs it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Lord needs it. Yeah. He cocks his double barrel shotgun. Sometimes. The Lord is going to call us to do something. But you go, Lord, are you sure? Did you pick the right person? I'm scared to do that. I don't know. If I, if I do that, if I take a step of faith, what if? What if I don't find the donkey? What if I go, go walking up to the, the, the house and the guy sitting out on the porch at his house, kicking back on a Sunday afternoon or whatever, drinking an iced tea, and I come walking up to untie the, the donkey, and he goes, hey, what are you doing to my donkey? That's a brand new donkey. That's a four-wheel drive donkey, four-legged donkey. It's a hybrid. Paid big money for it. What are you doing? Well, I, 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 how do you explain that? How do you explain to somebody that has never really taken a bold step of faith that the Lord is calling you to step out of the boat? Pastor Cap did a, a study on stomping on the storm a while back that was incredible. And I just thought about Peter in, in the boat. Lord, if that's you, bid me to come. What do you, the other 11 guys, what, what do you think they're saying? Don't do it. Are you local? What's the matter with you? People don't walk on water. I know, but 
the Lord's calling me. All I know is that the Lord's calling me. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to sink. I don't know how it's going to, I don't know if I'm going to walk a foot. I don't know if I'm going to walk a mile. I don't know, but I can't, I can't stay in the boat. I can't. But we're staying in the boat. We're safe. Well, go ahead. But I just can't. You got a boat. There's something that you turn to for safety. The Lord calls you to take a bold step of faith. Oh, but Lord, no, you don't understand. See, I, it's uh, this job. I, 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 can't, I can't leave this job. That's your boat. The Lord calls you to trust him. Take a bold step of faith and trust him with your, with the, your kids. Oh, Lord, no, any, no, no, those are my kids. Those are my kids. That's your boat. We all got a boat. That's how he goes. They go and they don't have all the, the understanding. It's the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8 where the author of Hebrews says, uh, by faith Abraham, when called to go to a place that he would later receive as an inheritance, he obeyed and he went. <laughs> not knowing where he was going. Explain that to your wife. <laughs> Honey, we're going on a trip. We are? Where? I don't know. <laughs> 1985, Pastor Todd, this will be quick. <laughs> Pastor Todd mentioned about us leaving Las Vegas to come to Florida to start Calvary Chapel. I was a concrete finisher. I was a heavy equipment operator, backhoes, front end loaders, dozers. And God calls me to go with a pastor. I never worked at a church. Never planned to work at a church. We had built two homes. I'm going to be a builder. The Lord calls me and my wife. and our, We had a 10-year-old, an 8-year-old, and 2-year-old, 1985. Go across the country. We've been as far east as Flagstaff, Arizona. That's all we knew. Florida. Well, you don't understand. Uh, uh, what, what am I going to do? Uh, 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 how, how do we? And, and my, I'd come home from work and my wife would go, so what would you decide? Uh, are we going? I, I don't know. What about our house? We built this house. I don't know, but I need to know if we're going to Florida or not. They're leaving in two months. I'd come home the next day. Uh, what would you decide? Are we going to Florida? Um, I don't know, what about our parents, our, our parents, all our, our parents and all our family, everybody lived in Las Vegas. What about our, all our family? I don't know, but you need to decide, are we going to Florida? The next time I come home, uh, are we, you need to tell me, are we going to Florida? What about the money? We don't have the money. And my wife, man, God used her. My wife says to me, I think you're making a mistake. You keep saying, what if? What if we, go to, if we go to Florida, what about our house? If we go to Florida, what about our family? If we go to Florida, what about the money? She said, why don't you do this? Why don't you decide, first of all, is it the will of God for us to go to Florida? Decide that first. And I really believe that God will begin to answer everything else. When you're in a place that you're pray, praying about, Taking a bold step of faith. Yeah, but, but what if? What if I can't find a job? What if I fail? What if it don't work out? No, 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 no. Is it the will of God for you to take that bold step? Decide that. Decide that. I came home uh, the next day, babe. I made a decision. It's the will of God for the Gomez family to go to Florida. My wife says, what are we going to do about the money? <laughs> I, I, I have no idea. I have no idea. All I know is I've stepped out of the boat and I've decided the will of God is we're going to Florida. And God began to supply everything we need. 
So there will be time that you just scratch your head and you go, Pastor Todd asked me to teach what? I'm not a teacher. I've never done that. Don't ever say that. Okay, well, you can say that. I've never done that. But don't put a period at the end of that. Put a comma. I've never done that comma yet. Yet. When you put a period at the end of something, you close the door. Just go, ah, Pastor, I, I, I've never done that yet. I, 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 I ended up being the worship leader at Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale, in the funeral home. But I couldn't sing or play an instrument. And I was the worship leader because Bob said, the, uh, we need somebody to lead worship. Fidel, can you, you know two chords. Uh, well, it's going to take five or six days to get to Florida. You can learn some more chords. <laughs> I've never done that yet. Yeah. I ended up doing it for, I ended up doing it for a couple of years. I ended up, I could carry a tune and, and learn a few more chords, but I never became a musician or a vocalist, but I did what was needed at the time. So they go, they go and they untie the coat and you got to, you, okay, switch, switch now, switch. You, you're not the, you're not the two guys. You're the donkey owner. And they say to you, we're taking your, your, um, your pickup truck, your minivan. We're taking your donkey. And you're the donkey owner. What would, when they said, the Lord needs it, what was his response? Nothing. Now, I don't know if he said anything. But let's look at that and go, that's a, a step, that's a bold step of faith where he said, let, let me put words in his mouth. The Lord needs it. Take him. Take him. I just brought him home from the showroom, but it's the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What if the Lord called you to give away something that is very precious to you? And it's time for you to step it up, to grow up spiritually and to let go of something that is very precious to you. You know, I talk to many people, and I've all, I love to ask them this question. Hey, when you die as a Christian, uh, who would you like to meet in heaven? And, of course, Jesus. And I always tell them, besides Jesus, besides the Apostle Paul. <laughs> There's a lady in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12. I want to meet her. It's called the widow with the two mites. Oh, my God. I want to look at her and go, how did you do it? She's got, she's a widow. Not only is she a widow, but you know what she is? She's a poor widow. And Mark chapter 12 says that she takes two mites, less than a penny. And she goes up to the temple and she takes her two mites She's not just a widow. She's a, you need those. You, you got to have those to live on. This is not what's extra in your savings account. You didn't just draw from your retirement account, from your IRA. There was no food stamps. There was no retirement. There was no government assistance. She's got less than a penny and she just lets it go. I trust that the Lord's going to provide. There might be somebody here that the Lord's just going, I want you to take a bold step of faith. I want you to trust me. So let's look at this, the next verse. And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. 
So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to write on. I, I wrote this in verse 32. Bold, bold faith means that you trust the Lord with all things. We said that he just gave the, the donkey away. But bold faith, bold faith also means this. This is very important. Because everybody that's in this room and you're watching on the online is waiting for something. <laughs> Some of you are waiting like, when's this guy going to get done? It's, uh, we're all waiting for something. Listen to this. Listen to this. Bold faith continues to believe in spite of continued waiting. You're waiting for something. Waiting to get married. Waiting to have a child. Waiting to find a job. Waiting to get into ministry. Waiting on something. And I love the way that the book of Romans chapter 4 puts it when it comes to Abraham. Because you see, the Lord had promised Abraham when Abraham was 75 years old, God promised him that him, him and his wife Sarah was going to have a child. Uh, getting the promise that you're going to have a child when you're 75 is tough enough. But 25 years have gone by now. And he's 100 years old and it hasn't happened yet. And in Romans chapter 4, Romans takes us uh, all the way back to the book of Genesis. And, and, and uh, Paul in the book of Romans, in speaking about that, says this about, uh, um, about Abraham. He says, without weakening in his faith, Abraham faced the fact. He faced the fact that his body was good as dead. Since he was about 100 years old and Sarah's womb was already dead. Yet, somebody say yet. Yet, he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promises of God. But he was strengthened in the faith. And he gave glory to God. Being fully assured that God had the power to do what he had promised. Do you understand that? There's times that you wait, but you don't waver. You don't waver in your waiting time. In closing, let me leave you with this. You, ha you might happen to be here today, as Pastor Todd mentioned, visiting, invited by a friend, bribed by, go taking you to, breakfast after church today if you'd only come to church and you've never given your life to Christ. Well, let me leave you with this. Jesus gave an invitation. He said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. He said, if anybody is thirsty, the invitation was open. Skin color, don't matter. Income level, don't matter. Background check, don't worry about it. He said, if anyone is thirsty, come to me. And who isn't thirsty? Teenagers are thirsty for friends. Seniors are thirsty for hope. Brokenhearted people are thirsty for a second chance. Shame-filled individuals are thirsty to be accepted. Who isn't, who isn't thirsty? Jesus could not have made it any clear. Oh, but you don't understand, preacher. I've done some things. I'm pretty evil. I've been sinful. I, I, I've never been like a church-going person. <laughs> think, of, think of the thief on the cross for a second. I can't wait to meet him. I can't wait to meet the thief on the cross and ask him, hey, how, how did it work out for you? One moment you're on the cross and you're cursing him. You're cursing him. You've never been to a church. You've never been to a Bible study. You've never been baptized. You know nothing about church attendance. And yet, you made it. How did you make it? And the guy probably said, I don't know. 
So one of the angels must have come over and, and must have looked at this guy, the thief on the cross, and go, what are, you, what are you doing here? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I, I just, I don't know. Well, uh, let me call my supervisor angel. Supervisor angel comes over and he says to the guy, the thief on the cross, well, let me, let me ask you just a couple of questions here. Are you clear? Are you absolutely clear on the doctrine of justification by faith? And the, guy, the thief on the cross goes, I have no idea what that means. And he says, okay, well, let me ask you one, one, one last question. One last question. What, what's your thought on the inerrancy of scripture? He goes, what? What is it? And the the supervisor angel in frustration says, wait, hold on a second. Let me ask you this. On what basis are you here? And the thief on the cross says, the man on the middle cross said I could come. Because Jesus said I could come. That's why I'm here. Not because I deserve it. And so if you happen to be with us today and you've never given your heart because you feel like you just don't belong, you don't have a place, let me tell you, Jesus died for you and he said, whoever comes to me, I'll never drive away. And so as we play this last song and you're sitting in your seat here or upstairs and you want to give your life to Christ, you might be the only one. You might be the only person that comes forward and gives their life to Christ. And if that's the case, check this out. That means that you are so special that God put this whole thing together just for you. Just for you. And so let's go ahead and play. Let's go ahead and play. And as this song is playing, you come and give your life to Jesus.